Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today, and thank you for everyone who is joining us online at the moment. And my name is Denis Savelyev. I am an administrator for the Arthur Jeffrey Center and a lecturer in Islam here. And before we start, I just um, mention a couple of things. So we will have a Q&A session after the lecture, and you will be able to submit your questions online. If you follow this QR code on this link, you can submit your questions. And you don't have to wait until the session is finished. If you have a question, you can start typing straight away. And in the end, we will have them answered. And for those of you who are joining us online, you will have the link for Q&A session in the description. And after, so after we have Q&A session, there will be some tea and coffee outside. So if you're present here, please stay to have some time together. And our main speaker today was supposed to be Bernie Power, but I was told that he can't attend today. So instead of Bernie Power, we have Mabruk all the way from Yemen. Please, please give a hand to Mabruk. Welcome. <laughs> Hi, and great, great to be with you, and greetings to those um, from all around the world. I've been getting people saying I'm going to join you tonight, so welcome to you all. I, I should start off with a disclaimer. Um, I was asked to speak at an Arabic church a couple of weeks ago, and they said, um, oh, we'll need to have a translator. And I said, well, actually, I, I can speak Arabic. I can, translate, I can translate for myself. And so I would say an Eng a, word, a sentence in English and then tr uh, a set the same sentence in Arabic. And I told the story about how I, Mabruk, I'd come from Yemen as a Muslim. I'd been born there, and I'd become a Christian and whatever. Anyway... Clearly, my Arabic was very convincing because afterwards, one of the ladies from Iraq came up and said, so wonderful to hear your story about how you left Islam. What part of Yemen were you born in? <laughs> and I said, Bankstown. <laughs> In the western suburbs of Sydney. She said, oh, okay, yeah. So this isn't really me. You know, like, this is like, I'm dressed up. So just in case that confuses people. Let's get started. So I'm going to tell you the story of my life. My name is Mabruk. I'm from Yemen. And I want to particularly tell you how I became a follower of Jesus. Here's a picture of me when I got married. That's me there in the middle. That was about 50 years ago. You can see I haven't changed very much. Um, but that's there, me there with my dad, with my grandpa, with my brothers, with my cousins and nephews. We're all there. I come from a very large Muslim family. And here's all the ladies. There's my wife in there, my mother, my sisters, my girl cousins, my aunties. I know who they are, but they're all in there. We came, come from a little village in the outskirts of Yemen, and this is it here. Um, it's a, a pretty kind of uh, barren place, but we are farmers, and you can see our farmland down there, spread by rain and springs. And it's hard work being a farmer there in Yemen, um, but praise God, that's what, that's what we get. I went to the little village school in, in, the, uh, in the village, and um, by the grace of God, I was a good student. And so when I got to old enough, my family said, you could actually go to university in the capital. You don't need to be a farmer. And so I did. I went into Sana'a, the capital, uh, in there, the big city, um, and I started studying at the university there, studying maths and science. That was my degree. One of my teachers was um, a man from Australia. You can see him there on the left-hand side, uh, Dr. Power. He, we called him Abu Yasser. Abu Yasser, because it means father of Yasser. And uh, he, he was, a, he was a, a good teacher. Actually, he was probably the best teacher I've ever had. <laughs> and I like him particularly because he wrote a book about me, which is called The Storytellers. And you can read that and buy a copy outside afterwards. But Abu Yasser was an interesting man because he was the first Christian that I had ever met. In Yemen, we're all Muslims, and he was a Christian. And so I was convinced, I, I was uh, uh, dedicated to converting him to Islam. So every Friday, I would go around to his house. His house was near to the university, and I would ask him a question. And the first time I went around there, I saw him reading a book. And I said, uh, Abu Yasser, what's this book you're reading? And he said, it's, it's the Injil, the, the Holy Gospel. 
And I said, don't read that book. Because, you know, Christians have your holy book, but we all know that book has been changed. It's corrupted. What you call the Bible today, that book you're reading, is not the original Bible that was given to Moses and David and Jesus. The only unchanged book from, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Quran. Now, I thought he was going to argue with me because that's what Christians did, I thought. And he just smiled and he said, let me tell you a story. This is a story about a, a blank. Um, ah, there he is. He just woke up. Um, uh, a shopkeeper. And he had a little shop in Sana. And you see these shops. They're all around us here. And he had a pretty good business. But one day he received word that his brother was going to get married. And he thought, I have to go back to my village for my brother's wedding. So he invited his best friend, Ali, and said to Ali, would you look after the shop while I'll be away? A couple of days, a couple of weeks, I don't know. But when I come back, um, you just look after the shop. And Ali says, you're my best friend. I promise I'll do my best. And so he goes away. And when he comes back after a couple of weeks, there's Ali sitting outside the shop, crying, crying. And he says to him, Ali, what's wrong? And Ali says, well, you wouldn't believe it. He said, on Friday, I just went next door for the prayers. It was only five minutes. And while I was away, I don't know what happened, but when I came back, all the money was gone. And the shopkeeper said, don't worry, there's lots of thieves in Yemen. I understand. Well, a month later, the shopkeeper gets word that his sister's going to have a baby in the village. This will be the first grandchild. He said, I have to go back for the celebrations. And so he calls his friend in Ali, Ali and he says, Ali, would you look after the shop for me? I'll be away a couple of days or a couple of weeks, I don't know. But this time, promise you won't leave the shop. You can pray inside the shop. And Ali says, I promise I won't leave. Well, he goes away, comes back a few weeks later, and there's Ali sitting outside crying, crying. And he says, Ali, what's wrong? And he said, you wouldn't believe it. I stayed in, inside the shop the whole time. But one afternoon, I fell asleep. And when I woke up, all the money was gone. And the shopkeeper said, don't worry, there's lots of thieves in Yemen. A month later, he gets word that his mother's sick. And he said, I have to go back. I can get some medicine from, from Sana and I have to take it back to her, to the village. And calls in his friend Ali. Ali, he says, please, this time, don't leave the, mo don't leave the shop, don't fall asleep. And Ali says, I promise I will. He goes away, comes back a couple of weeks later, and there's Ali crying, crying. And he says, Ali, what happened? He said, you wouldn't believe it. He said, I didn't leave the shop. I didn't fall asleep. But one day, a whole lot of people came into the shop, and they were all buying things and yelling and, and, and whatever. And when I turned around, all the money was gone. And the shopkeeper says, don't worry, there's lots of thieves in Yemen. Well, a month later, he gets the worst news that he's ever heard in his life. His father had died in the village. And he said, I have to go back to the village for my father's funeral. And the question is, will I ask Ali to look after the shop again? And when Abu Yasser asked me that, I said, of course you shouldn't, ask, you shouldn't ask him. You can't rely on this guy. He's failed three times. How could you rely on him the fourth time? And Abu Yasser said to me, yeah, that's interesting, because in Islam you say you've got four holy books. You've got the Torah, the Old Testament. You've got the Psalms, the Zabur. You have the Gospel, which is the Injil, and the Quran. And you believe all of them came from Allah. And I said, that's true, I believe that. And he said, it also says in the Quran that Allah will protect his holy books. There's the verse, we, that is Allah, who have sent down the dhikr, that's the, the remembrance, we will guard it from corruption. And the dhikr in the, in the Quran is the, the Quran itself, the Torah, the, the Injil, and the people of the book are called Ahla dhikr, the people of the remembrance. So all of these books are included in that, and Allah promises to protect them. He said, but I have a question, because how reliable is, is Allah? You talked about, I told you the story about Ali. Uh, he went to his brother's wedding and Ali failed. He went for his sister's baby and Ali failed. He went for his mother's sickness and Ali failed. And the fourth time, you said he shouldn't go. But in, you say that there are four books. You say there is the Torah and you say that's been corrupted. The, Za, the Psalms, the Zabur, and you say they've been corrupted. The Injil, the Gospel, and you say they've been corrupted. So why should I believe that Allah can protect the Quran if he's failed three times? 
I had to think about that. And he said, I'll give you the answer. He said, there's four options. He said, first of all, maybe Allah didn't know his holy books were being, were being changed. And so maybe he's not all knowing. Or maybe he knew, but he couldn't stop people from changing his books. So he's not all powerful. Or maybe he knew and he could have stopped them, but he didn't. So he didn't keep his promise. So he's untrustworthy. And I thought, those aren't very good choices. And he said, do you want to know what I think? And I said, please, tell me. He said, I think that God is all-knowing, all-powerful, trustworthy, and no one could change his books. And I said, I think I agree with you. And he said to me, would you like to read the Bible? And he gave me one. Well, I took it home and I started to read it. He said to start in the Gospel of Mark. So I opened up. The beginning of the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I thought terrible how could you possibly say that god has a son and i got really angry the next friday i was back at his house abu yasa you've deceived me you claim that jesus is the son of god or your book says that how could god have a physical relationship with a woman and produce a son how's that possible and he said well jesus is not a physical son of god because god is spirit and spiritual beings cannot have physical children Jesus said, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. And he said, do you know this term in the Quran, Ibn Sabil? It means the son of the road. And I said, of course I know this. I read the Quran and I know this term. It means a traveller, someone who's going on the road. He's a son of the road. And he says, but it's not a physical son. It's not as though the traveller is a physical son of the road and a tree or a mountain or something else that had a, a, a physical relationship. It's a metaphorical term. It's not a wallet. That's an Arabic word for uh, a, a physical child. It's a, a spiritual or a metaphorical one. So the traveller gets his identity, direction and destination from the road. And so when we think about Jesus, Jesus is the son of God. He's not a physical son of God by a physical relationship. It's a symbolic, uh, a metaphorical, a spiritual sonship relationship because Jesus gets his identity, direction and destination from his heavenly father. It's about the relationship. And he said, let me tell you a story. He said, there was once uh, a king who ruled over a prosperous kingdom. It was a very peaceful place, a beautiful place, and the people lived in peace and harmony. And he got married to a beautiful queen, and they had a little boy, a son, the prince. And they loved this little prince. And as the little boy grew up, he became more and more like his father and his mother, and everybody loved the prince. Well, one day the king was there watching from his palace into the village below and he sees his family going around knocking door to door, begging. And he thought, what's this? We're a prosperous kingdom. We shouldn't have beggars in our, in our place, in our, uh, in our uh, kingdom. So he sends one of his guards and says, find out who these people are and why they need to beg. <laughs> So the guard comes back and says, Your Majesty, these people have come from a far country. There's been a war and a famine and they had to leave everything and they've come here with nothing. And the king's heart was moved to compassion by this. And he says to his guard, I want you to go to the royal stores, get food and clothing for these people and take it down. But look, more than that, I want you to give them a plot of land by the river. Good land where they can grow crops and support themselves. He said, but tell them that we have rules in our kingdom. And one is that at harvest time, they give a certain proportion of their crops for public works for the kingdom. And the guard goes down and tells them this. I thought, this is a great deal. Yes, yes, we agree. Well, the first year, uh, they, they, had lots of, uh, they didn't have many crops. And when the, the tax collector comes around, they said, look, we actually haven't got much. Would it be OK if we get excused this year? And he goes back to the king, and the king says, sure, no problem, first year. The next year, there's a bumper crop. They've got more crops than they can, than they can use. And so the tax collector goes around from door to door to collect it. And when he comes to their farm, they said, why should we give crops to the king? We grew it. If the king wants crops, he can grow his own stuff. And then he said, oh, maybe they don't understand. I'll send the treasurer down to explain the budget and how we use the money. So when the treasurer comes down, they treated him disrespectfully. They threw rocks at him and they chased him out of of their property. And he goes back to the king and he tells the king. And the king says, oh, 
this is serious. Maybe they don't understand how we work. I know, I'll send my son down to them. Everyone respects my son, and he will uh, explain things to them. And so the young prince, now grown up to be a young man, comes down to this little plot uh, in the village. And when they see him coming, they say, this is the son of the king. If we kill him, we can have this land forever. And so they, as soon as the, the prince enters their land, they set upon him with rocks and sticks and they kill him. And then they throw his body outside the property. The people are horrified. The people of the village, they've never seen anything like this. And so they take the body of the young, king, the young prince back up and place it before the king in the palace. And the king is so angry. And he calls the captain of his guard and he says, I want you to go and collect every soldier you can. Bring them back from wherever they are. Even they're on leave, bring them back. Go down to the armory, get every weapon that you can and go in and destroy those people. And so the captain of the guard salutes and he goes off. Well, the queen has a different approach. She sees the body of the young prince there and she picks him up and carries him into a back room. And she's got magical powers and she's able to bring the young prince back to life. And she says to him, when your father built this, he ran a tunnel system underneath that connects to every house in the village. If there was a war, they could all come to the palace for protection. You'll find a, a tunnel which will lead you directly to the house of that family. You know what you have to do. And the young prince said, I do. And he jumps into the tunnel and he starts running. Well, just at this time, the army arrives at the house and they surround the house and the commander is about to give the order to go in and kill everyone inside there when suddenly the door's op door opens and out walks a young prince. And he says, stop. He said, I've talked with these people and they are very sorry for what they have done. I want to go and talk to my father on their behalf. And so they walk back up to the, the palace, the young prince in front, this family behind him and all the soldiers behind them. And he comes and he stands before his father. And he says, Father, these people are very sorry for the terrible things that they have done. And we have a saying in our, in our, um, uh, in our culture, and here I use the Arabic one, it says, La yuxilil ar illa bidam. Nothing washes away shame except for blood. This is one they use in Yemen and in other parts of the Arab world as well. And he said, I want my blood actually lies on the ground outside of their property. I want you to accept my blood as payment for their sin. And the father says, if I heard this from anyone except you, my beloved son, or if, if you hadn't paid for their sin, I wouldn't listen. But because your blood has been spilled, your blood has washed away their sin. And he said, I forgive these people. And more than that, I invite them to come and live in the palace with you and myself and the queen to become part of our family. And we'll look after them as though they were our own family. And the people of the kingdom were amazed at the grace of the king. They were amazed at the courage of, of the son. They were amazed at the power of the queen. And then Abu Yasa said to me, what do you think about this story? And I said, that is a beautiful story. I wish the world was like that. And he said, it is. I didn't quite know what to, to do about that, but I went away and I read a little bit more of, of the Bible. And there, as I read through the Bible, I found something that was very unusual. I found that God's actually got lots of sons in the Bible. So in the Bible, Jesus is called the son of God, but there's all Adam is called the son of God, so are the beings in Genesis, the angels, the kings, the rulers, peacemakers, people who believe in the son in Jesus are called sons of God. So being called a son of God is not unique. God, God has tons of sons. It doesn't prove that Jesus is God. And he said to me, yes, there are many types of son, uh, sons of God in the Bible, but are they all the same? Let me tell you a story. He always does this. <laughs> it's about a fireman. He works in the village, and one day there's a fire in a house, and he runs down to the house there with his, with his fire truck, ready to put the fire out, and the people say, look, we're in a desperate situation. The house is going to collapse any minute. You'll have time to do one trip in there. We want you to save as many living things as you can. 
And so the fireman runs into the house and he looks around. He arrives in the kitchen. And there over in the corner is some rotting fruit, some bacteria. On another corner, there's a potted petunia. In another one, he sees a cockroach hiding in a cup. He sees some chickens in a crate in another place and in another corner, a baby in a bassinet. And he thinks to himself, these are all living things created by God and I was told to save as many living things but I can only save one. I wonder which one it will be. And I said to him, of course, you should save the baby. He said, hmm, that's interesting you should say that because when we look at living things, is that going to do anything? No. When we look at living things, we can see all of them are created by God. Microorganisms, plants, insects, animals, and humans. They are all living things. They're like, and human beings are like other creatures at the same time, but not in the same sense or to the same degree. Humans are of a different order to all other living things. And I said, yes, I believe that. But what's that got to do with the Son of God? He said, well, when we look at the sons of God in the Bible, we see Adam and all humans are sons of God by virtue of creation, Israel by election, the kings of Israel by anointing, Christians by adoption, peacemakers by their action, but Jesus by his eternal nature. Jesus is a son of God. He's a son of God at the same time, but not in the same way. He's of a different order to all the other sons of God. All of these other ones uh, became or were made sons of God by their actions, but Jesus was always the son of God from eternity. And he said, for example, if I go down to a public park and I see a whole lot of people there and they're having a party and they're making a lot of noise. You know Yemenis make lots of noise. He said, yeah, yeah. And he said, he's, I say to them, I pay my taxes, so I'm an owner of this land. It's a public park. Go away. And they, re they reply, well, we pay taxes too. We're also owners of this land just as much as you are. So he has no authority in that situation. But the next day, this family comes along to his house and they set up a picnic on his front lawn. And he comes out and says, I am the owner of this land. Go away. Does he have authority to do that? And I said, of course he does. He has full authority because he is the only owner of this land. It belongs to him exclusively. And he said, well, with Jesus, he never said, I am a son of God just like you. He said, I am the son of God. So he claimed to be exclusively, uniquely the son of God in a different way to all the other sons of God. And he said to the people, why do you accuse me of blasphemy? Because I said, I'm the son of God. And they said, he has made himself the son of God, so he ought to die. And at the trial, they, the high priest said, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? And Jesus said, I am. So Jesus made this claim to be the unique son of God in a way that nobody else is. And then he said to me, you, under, you know the Quran, don't you? I said, of course, I read it every, every day. I read the Quran. I've learned it from a little child. I know. And he said, when we look in the Quran, we see a whole lot of things about Allah that the Quran teaches. It teaches that he creates, he heals, he raises the dead, he fed the hungry, he changed the law, he knows the hidden things, he knows the last hour, he's holy and sinless, he's in heaven and he's highly exalted. And those references, I said, I know all of those things about Allah. Those are all true and he said but interestingly the Quran also says exactly the same things about Jesus Jesus is the one who creates it said he took ground for uh, some dirt from the ground and breathed into it and it became a bird Jesus healed the sick the lepers and the blind Jesus raised the dead according to the Quran he fed the hungry he could change the law Jesus knew the hidden things. He knows the last hour according to the Quran. He's holy and sinless. He's in heaven now and he's highly exalted. And I said, yeah, that's right. I'd never seen that before. But it's true. All of those ten things are true. But he was, that was because he was a prophet and all of the prophets were special. And I said, he said to me, who do you think was the greatest prophet? And I said, Prophet uh, Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
And he said, interesting, when I look in the Quran, I see Muhammad could do none of those things. He could, couldn't create, he couldn't heal, he couldn't raise the dead, he couldn't feed the hungry. They asked him to change the law and he said, I can't do that, only Allah can change it. They asked him, show us where there's treasure hidden in the ground. He said, I don't know that, only Allah knows it. When's the last hour? I don't know, only Allah knows. Um, he was told four times in the Quran to ask forgiveness for his sins, so he wasn't sinless. He's not in heaven now. He's buried in, uh, in Medina, and he's not highly exalted. He said, I'm just a man. So when we look at how Jesus is described in the Quran, it's much closer to Allah than Muhammad. So Jesus is not a prophet just like Muhammad. He's actually got character and actions much more similar to Allah. And I said, yeah, but I don't know if you can say that Jesus is God just because those things are there. And he said, let's have a look at what the Bible says. It says about Jesus claiming eternal uh, existence. He said, before Abraham was, I am. He called God his own father. He, um, the Jews accused him of claiming to be God. He made exclusive allegiance claims. He says, unless you love um, uh, love me more than your mother or father or wife or children, you cannot be my disciples. He said, the Father and I are one. He applied divine titles from the Old Testament to himself. He called himself the light of the world. He called himself the good, the, the good shepherd. He called himself the Lord of the Sabbath. Satan says to him, to Jesus, you shall not, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Satan knew who Jesus was. He claimed the authority to forgive sins. He claimed to give eternal life. Only God can give eternal life. He claimed authority to judge the earth. He claimed perfect sinlessness. He accepted human worship. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. And according to the Bible, he is now sitting on heaven's throne. Who else sits on God's throne except God himself? I said, okay. All right, so Jesus is a special person, but... Hmm. He could be the son of God. I don't know. And so I went away and I read a little bit more. Well, the next week I came back and I said, I've got him this time. There's no way he's going to wriggle out of this one. I've been reading about the Trinity. I said, the Trinity doesn't make sense. God can't be three and one at the same time. We believe that God is just one. Why don't you believe that? And he didn't argue with me. He just says, let me tell you a story. <laughs> Frustrating guy. He says this is about a man named Ahmed. One night, he's out walking in the desert. And I knew, I lived out in the desert, I knew what it was like. And as Ahmed's walking along, he falls down a deep hole in the sand. Well, it's a real problem because the sand is so soft. And the harder he tries, the worse his situation gets. And soon he's buried up to his waist in the sand. And he realises, I'm not going to be able to escape from this without help. And so he cries... Help, somebody up there, please help me. And soon a face appears at the top and looks down and says, I would love to come down and help you, but I'm alone. I can't do it. But what I can do is I can send you down a book. And if you read this book, you can maybe work out how to save yourself. So he dropped a book down to him and then he disappeared. Well, at the same time, in another part of the desert, there's a man named Mabruk. And I said, that's me. That's my name. I'm Mabruk. And he said, yeah, this is what happened to you. One day, you, one night, you're walking in the desert and you fell down a hole. And the same thing happened. The more you tried, the worse your situation got. And soon you're buried up to your waist and there's no way. You realise, I'll never escape by myself. I need help. And you call out, help, somebody up there. Please help me. And soon, three faces appear at the top and they look down and say, Mabruk, you're in a dangerous situation, but we will do everything we can to save you. Well, amongst the three, one of them was very strong. This guy could lift anything. The second one was very brave. He would do anything. He wasn't afraid of a thing. And the third one was very gentle. He was always looking for ways to help other people. Well, the strong one says, I've got a rope and I can drop it down into the grave, but someone has to go down and dig uh, Mabruk out. And the brave one says, I'm your man, I will go down. And so the strong one and the gentle one hold the rope, and the brave one goes down into the hole. And he starts digging the sand carefully away from Mabruk. It's very dangerous because the walls are soft. It's quite deep, and the, the sand could collapse at any moment. 
And so he digs, the, digs it and he takes a rope off himself and ties it around Mabruk's waist. And then the strong one and the gentle one begin to pull Mabruk out of the hole. He gets nearly to the top when his foot hits the side of the hole and suddenly, suddenly, all the sand falls down and buries the brave one at the bottom and kills him. He dies. At this point, I nearly burst into tears. This was the saddest story I'd ever heard. Someone came to try and save me and he died in the process. How could that happen? Well, Abu Yasser says, you know what? That's not the end of the story because the, the, the strong one and the gentle one said, even though our companion is dead, we will not abandon him to the grave. And they started to, to dig. They dug and they dug and they dug for three days. Random figure, by the way. And they get down and there is the brave one and he's dead. And so they take him up to the top. And the gentle one says, I can breathe into him and by the power of God, he can come back to life again. And he does. He breathes and praise God, the one who was dead comes back to life. And so there's great rejoicing. There's great rejoicing. Um, because not only was the, the, the one who was dead had come back to life, but Mabruk, who had been lost, was saved. And then Abu Yasser turns to me and he says to me, so who would you rather be in this story? Would you like to be Ahmed, who's still in the, in the grave with a book, sorry, grave, still in the hole with a book, trying to save himself, or Mabruk, who had been saved by the death of the brave one who came to his rescue? And I said to him, oh, Abu Yasser, you are a very clever man. He said, you know what we believe. We believe that we have God the Father, our Father in heaven, who is always loving us and doing what he can for our benefit. Jesus is God the Son who came down to earth. He is God who is with us. And the Holy Spirit is God who is in us. Well, I had to think about that. So I went away for a week and I thought about it. The next Friday I came back and I said, oh, I've really got him this time. He won't be able to answer this. I said, if you believe that Jesus saves you, that he forgives your sins, then you can basically do whatever you want and just say, Jesus has saved me. I, I don't have to worry about my actions. He said, let me tell you a story. <laughs> it's about a man who went down to Aden, Aden, down in the south of Yemen. And it was New Year's Eve and there was a cruise ship there and they were going to go out um, for a cruise out into the... I'm going to say Indian Ocean, but it's probably not. Whatever that big block is. Anybody know what it is? Sorry, it's not the Red Sea is there. It's probably the India. Sorry? Uh, it's probably the Gulf of Aden. Let's go for that one, yeah. He goes out into the sea. Um, and he doesn't know anybody on this boat. He kept, it's gone on late. And he's actually had a few drinks before he gets on there. And they get out there in the sea. And he's there leaning back and looking at the stars. And whoops, he tips over backwards and falls into the sea. And nobody sees him. He just disappears under the water with a splash. And when he comes up, the ship's gone. It's disappeared. Um, he can see the stars, but he can't see anything else. And he thought, I'll tread water. And in the morning, I'll see which way's land and I'll swim towards it. And so he's treading water and then the sun comes up and he looks around 360 degrees of horizon. Doesn't know which way to swim. Even if he could swim that far, doesn't know which direction to set off. And he's thinking, well, this is probably the end of me. And he's treading water and suddenly he hears the nicest sound he's ever heard in his life. It's going like this. It's a fishing boat come by. And they see him there and they say, Ahoy, you in the water, do you want to be saved? And he said, you bet I do. And he puts his hand up and they pull him into the boat. And he said, I am so grateful for what you have done for me. Thank you, you saved my life. How can I ever repay you? And they said, well, actually, we've got a bit of a problem. We're a fishing boat and one of our crew members got sick. Um, and so we're going to be out for three days and we need actually someone else to help us. Could you do that? And he said, I would do anything. And so he starts to work on the boat and doing the best that he can. And eventually they go back to, uh, to the shore. And Abu Yasser said to me, this is just like a, a verse in the Bible. It says we're not saved by our good works, but we're saved to, go to do good works. It says in Ephesians, by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. You didn't save yourself, not by works. 
so no one can boast. You didn't swim out of there. But we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So Christians live their lives out of gratitude for what God has done, not out of hope for what they hope God, that God might do. I hadn't thought of this idea before. It was quite a new idea. Well, I came home and I was talking about this with my family and friends and my fellow students at uni. And they said, ah, yeah, but he won't talk about Muhammad, will he? And I thought, oh, yeah, I'll ask him about Muhammad. So next week I go back to him, Abu Yasa, what do you think about Muhammad? And he says, let me tell you a story. <laughs> there was a man who was out walking in the desert. And he, he, knows where he's, he knows the name of the place that he's going to, but he's never been there before, he's, so he's not sure how to get there. And as he's walking along, he comes across a fork in the road, and he thinks, which way will I go? Will I go left or go right? I don't know. But fortunately, there are two men there at the, uh, at the fork in the road. One of them is alive, and he's actually coming from the direction. Uh, he said, this is the place I've just gone to. Um, I'm coming there, and I'll take you with me. And the other one is dead. Um, who do you think he should ask? And I said, well, of course you ask the live man. <laughs> oh, I see what you're saying. Ah, oh, yeah. And he said, well, you know, Muhammad, he's been dead for 1,400 years. He can't help us. He can't hurt us. If we really want to get to heaven, then we need to go with someone who's alive and someone who's been there and has come back and is going to take us there with us, with him. And I thought, yeah, okay. Well, I was now at the point where I was ready to make a decision. I believed that the Bible was a book that had come from God. I believed that Jesus was the unique son of God, and I believed that he had saved us. I understood the Trinity. I understood a little bit about how you should live as a Christian. But I just needed something else to kind of move me over the line. So the next week I came back and I said, OK, I understand these things, but why should I follow Jesus? And he said, well... Let me tell you a story. Oh, he's got stories, this guy. It's about a man who lived in a beautiful palace. Oh, yeah, there's a beautiful palace. He, a man who lived in a beautiful palace. It was absolutely exquisite. But every morning, this man got up and he was worried. He wasn't a happy, he wasn't a happy man because he was a slave in the palace and his job was to scrub the floors. And so every morning, he, every day, he'd just scrub the floors and he was worried that if he didn't do a good enough job, the king would kick him out of the palace and then he would have nowhere to live. Well, at the same time, there was another man who lived in the palace who woke up every morning full of joy. He just such a positive person because he was the son of the king. He was the prince. And he said, my father loves me and he would never kick me out of the palace. This is my home. And Abu Yasa said, in the Quran, there's a verse that says, there's none in the heavens and the earth that comes to the most beneficent, that is to Allah, except as a slave. And said, when you pray, you pray like a slave. You bow down and you put your face on the ground like a slave. But Jesus had a different perspective. He said, a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. And he said, I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I have called you my friends. And if you hold to my teaching, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So Jesus offers freedom and sonship. And in Romans, Paul says, you didn't receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. By him we call Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has also made you an heir. That is, you will inherit the palace. So he said to me, who would you rather be? Do you want to be the slave forever or do you want to become the son? And I said, I want to become the son. And that was how I became a follower of Jesus. That was 50 years ago. Life hasn't been hard, it hasn't been easy since then. <clears throat> when my family found out, they took my wife away from me. I got beaten up and put in prison. And life was really hard. But God is faithful. And over time, things turned around as I prayed for my family. 
They returned my wife to me. She became a believer and my family is on the path. And I'm just trusting God for that, continuing to trust him for that. So that's the story of how I became a follower of Jesus. There's a couple of books out there if you want to have a look at those afterwards that tell the stories and whatever. Thank you. So I think we now have time for some questions. And I'll just see if some have come to me. I believe they have. All right. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, Bernie, what do you think the best two or three stories that show a significant difference between God, Jesus, and Allah, the Quran, that is benefits that God does not offer? So the first one that I would do when I talk, and each Saturday a group of us go out, I've got a few of my team members there, go out onto the streets um, of Melbourne and we talk with Muslim people. And the point that I'll often pick up, I'll ask them how are they going as a Muslim and, you know, how's it going? And I say, what would happen if you weren't fulfilling all your requirements, if you weren't praying? If you weren't fasting, if what, what would happen? And I had a guy a couple of weeks ago. He said, I'd probably go to hell. And I said, oh, are you expecting to spend some time in hell? He said, yes, I am. I said, oh, that's interesting. Uh, it's a bit sad, but it's interesting. Um, what would it be if God wasn't concerned about your works? I said, I've got grandchildren, two little boys. I love them dearly. I don't care what they do. I just love them. What if God looked at, at us that way and would do anything he could in order to save us? And he said, that would be great. And I said, that's what Jesus offers to us. So we're not, he said, Muslims believe that life is a test and you have to work your hardest and you finally, and you get the result at the end. Said for us, um, life is a relationship and we can start that now and it continues on and it will get deeper and richer after we die. It's not something that will be taken away. That's the choice that you have. So that would be the kind of approach. So um, probably the one of the two holes um, of, you know, Allah giving people a book and telling them they have to save themselves or Jesus coming down into the grave to save them. And we see there the Trinitarian aspect as well or the other story about the 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 king and, and, and the prince could do the job. So. Uh, another one. A Muslim friend said to me, um, the prophets represent God and they live righteous lives, but the Bible can't be true because it does, it records so many things that assassinate the character of these prophets. Um, and that would be a common thing. You read these terrible things about what um, uh, David did, his uh, adultery and, and murder of Uriah. Um, none of the prophets come out looking very good. And I say, yeah, exactly. That's why I don't follow a prophet. That's why I follow the, the Son of God. No human being can ever be an adequate model for you. Um, and and when they talk about Muhammad, I had a lady saying to me, yeah, well, we follow the prophet Muhammad. He's the best example. I said, oh, I'm not so sure about that. There were a couple of things about his character that I have some questions about. Um, and I talked about it. She got a bit upset. Um, but uh, I said, well, if I have the choice of following, would I follow Muhammad with his faults or would I follow Jesus with his perfection? That's really the choice that's got there. So we believe that the prophets did sin. The only sinless person in humanity, in human history, was Jesus himself. And so he's our model. He's the one that we follow, not a human prophet. Um, Muslim, we can't trust the Gospels. We have little evidence for the authors. Jesus wrote his own Gospel, but it's been replaced by the Quran. The unchanged copy is in heaven. How would you respond to that? Okay, so um, a couple of things there uh, about the, uh, the Gospels. We have little, little evidence of the authors as in terms of who they are. They'll say, well, um, so who was Mark? Um, or what was the name of John's father, or something like that. And I'd say, well, actually, um, we don't need to know the author of a book to know whether it's a good book or not. We look at the content, and the content will, whoops, content will tell us whether the book itself is, is something that's worthy of reading, worthy of following. Um, so we would look at it that way. Um, it's, you say, Jesus wrote his own gospel. Okay, can you show me a copy of that gospel, please? I would love to see it. And if they say, well, we don't have it, so you're talking about something that you know, you say exists but that you have no evidence for. There's no evidence that Jesus ever wrote a book. 
uh, and the third one, oh, uh, the Quran, the unchanged copy is in heaven. Um, I can go uh, this, with this one in, in quite a few directions. I would say, um, so one of the doctrines of the Quran, or of Islamic history, is called abrogation. They call it um, um, uh, nasik wa mansukh. Um, it's something which abrogates or is abrogated. And the Quran has many verses like this, things which were uh, true at one time but are not true now. Does the original copy have all of those ones as well, or uh, does it have verses that are no longer relevant that have been changed? We also have many verses that we know have been lost. For example, the verse of stoning of adulterers that used to be in the Quran, according to the earlier things. Is that one in the one in heaven? but it's not on the one here on earth. So which, I can't read the one in heaven, all I've got the one here on earth, and that's got some real issues with, about it. Um, and I've got a whole lot of other directions I could go with that. Um, so we can do that, and again, we don't have to get rude or aggressive, we can just put the, the facts out there as we understand them. Um, how, would you go, how would you go about explaining the concept of biblical forgiveness? Um, yeah, so we, we, first of all, we go to the, the idea of grace, of God's unmerited favour. So for Christians, we're, and we talked about there in Ephesians 2, we're not, saved, we're not saved by our works, but we are saved by grace. God comes to us at a time when we can't do anything for ourselves. The Muslim concept is often that they have to, they repent of their sins, and then they have to try try and do all the good deeds that will earn their salvation. Um, and perhaps at the end, inshallah, maybe Allah will forgive their sins. No one can be ever sure of that. In the Hadith, um, one time Muhammad said um, uh, to the people, um, so I can think of it in Arabic, uh, it's, he says, um, no one will be saved, no one will be saved by their good works. And they were a bit surprised by this. They said, not, not even you, a prophet of Allah, like you're the best guy who's ever lived on the earth. He said, not even me, unless God surrounds me with his grace and mercy. This is in the Hadith in Al-Bukhari, the, the, the Rolls-Royce version of the Hadith. Um, and so here's Muhammad not even sure that he's going to be forgiven. I said, so what hope have you got? And I really put it out there to them. So if Muhammad wasn't sure he was going to be forgiven, you really don't have that hope. But for us, it's not based on what we have done. It's based on what God has done for us through Jesus. If God says, I'm, I'm going to save you, you have been saved, we believe that. We don't need to try and do our best in order to do that. So that's quite a different kind of concept of forgiveness. Um, okay. Many young Afghan Muslims are a bit disillusioned by Islam and religion in general. What are some, some ways you could suggest to engage them towards Jesus? Um, it's interesting. So depending on the person that I meet, I always think about Islam as a spectrum. So you'll get the, the very radical groups down this end who are quite committed fundamentalists. At the other end, you'll get very liberal groups. And in the middle, you'll have the kind of the traditional um, group, uh, moderate people, uh, Muslims there. And depending on who we're talking to, we'll use different approaches. If it's a very liberal person, I wouldn't even talk about the Quran. Typically, they have given up on it. And particularly if Iranians, they'll say, we never read it, we never understood it, we don't care about it, don't even talk to us about it. So, great, happy to leave that behind. Let's go straight to the Bible, um, which is where I always want to end up. So, I think it's important to understand who your audience is and to respond appropriately to them. Now, with others, currently having a, a discussion with a young man um, who's very committed to the Quran and he believes that it's true and this is the revel revelation from Allah. And so, I will use the material from within the Quran because he doesn't accept the Bible as authoritative. So, I'll say, well, let's okay, let's just work with the material in the Quran and the Hadith, and we can build a, um, a, a, at least steps towards the gospel. Not the full gospel, but certainly steps towards the gospel um, on that. I've written, one of the books I wrote was called Engaging Islamic Traditions, where I use that approach with the Hadith. So how do you preach the gospel um, to a people when they um, uh, accept the Hadith? Um... My Muslim, oh, okay. 
uh, are church meetings allowed in Yemen or in the church underground? Any Yemeni refugees living in Australia? Yes. Um, yes, there are no above ground, <laughs> above ground. Publicly, there are no um, church meetings happening there. There is a church down in Aden, in Aden, but it's been closed for some years. It got hit by a, a bomb. Um, but there is a significant underground church. Um, that we know of and have contacts with um, of people and people that from our time that we knew there are followers of Jesus. So that's happening. God, you know, Jesus says, I will build my church. It won't be a building. Um, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And any Yemeni refugees living in Australia, yeah, re refugees, but also some that have come here as business people or uh, as skilled migrants. Um, so again, I met one of these uh, uh, just recently. So they're, they're around uh, there'd be lots of those. Um, okay, my Muslim friend, Jesus can't be God because he prays to God just like the other prophets. Um, so he's talking particularly here about, say, the, the, in the Garden of Gethsemane, but at other times we know that Jesus would pray to his father. And I'd say, well, it's imp important to understand what does prayer mean. For Muslims, when they pray, they pray in submission to Allah, and for them it is a work, it's not prayer as um, a relationship, it's a work in order to gain uh, acceptance or the benefit from Allah. So that they're doing this because they have to do it. For Christians, when we pray, we pray to God because we love to do it and because he loves us. So this is quite a different thing. So when Jesus um, prayed to his heavenly father, it was the communication between the father and the son, which had been going on from the very beginning. We believe that God has always existed as father, son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus says in John 14, you loved me before the foundation of the world. So that relationship was there. Jesus was always, the son was always in contact with the father. So when he comes down to earth, that connection is not broken. Jesus continues to pray. So when Muslims pray, they are praying to somebody who is uh, superior to them and who they're dependent on in order to gain their, uh, their, their, their lives, really. For Jesus, it was this connection between the Father and the Son, just as for us as his children, we have a connection with him. Um, should baptism be done in private and later declared? That's what we would typically do. Um, and I've baptised a few people here in, uh, uh, in Melbourne. Um, for them, it depends on where their family stands um, or if their family's around. Some will go for public baptism but not um, uh, allow it to be put out on, the me on social media or something. So it's something you need to be... And I always talk with the person about it, the implications of that. So I had a young man who's just recently become a Christian said, should I tell my parents? And I said, if you do, pretty likely your father will say, you're no longer my son, I'll, I'll have nothing to do with you. Um, and so you need to be prepared for that if and when you decide to do that. But I don't, tell, I don't say you, you need to go and do that. Um, uh, right. Um, could you put up a book list on the screen again? Oh, right. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you. That was my press agent doing that, yeah. Um, so online uh, participants get the titles, okay. Um, what would you say to Ahmed who says he believes but will still say Muslim and do shalat or salat, yeah. Um, and I'd say to them, this is a choice that you, you have. In, in God's eyes, you have freedom to do that and you, ha you have freedom to accept him or you have freedom to reject him, but there will be consequences. Um, amongst his 12 disciples, there was one Judas who rejected him. Um, and Jesus, at the very end, we see at the Last Supper, Jesus takes the food from the table and he puts it into Judas's mouth. Um, so the door was open to Judas right up until the last minute. And God would say to you, this invitation is still open. You can take it at, at any time. So I think it's important to, to do that. Um, you use a lot of parabolic stories. Do you find Bible stories helpful or do they create 
uh, barriers or have drawbacks. No, I, I do Bible stories probably more than I do the, the, these, um, these stories. Um, the, the reason that I developed these stories is that I found that there were lots of questions that Muslims asked, that there were no biblical stories. There's, um, there's biblical concepts, and I showed you some of those to relate to, but not stories. Many of the countries that we live in, or a couple of the countries that we lived in, the people were illiterate. And you couldn't give them, or you could give them a Bible, but they couldn't read it. And so we had to give them something that they would remember. We would tell the Bible stories, but also these ones. For example, the Bible has been changed. The, Quran, the, the Bible actually doesn't deal with that. It just assumes the idea of authority. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the Trinity, for example, is not carefully argued out in the, in the Bible. It's there, 60 passages with Father, Son and Spirit, but not clearly li uh, lined out on why we should believe in that or what the significance of that is. Um, yeah, so that was why I developed the stories. Um, yeah, and the one, the story tells us, I've got about 20 stories, ones that I didn't get time to tell today. My best friend... Um, yeah, so just on that, I tell Bible stories. Uh, Any time I come across a situation, I'll say, that reminds me of one time when Jesus said something or did something. Uh, my best friend is Muslim. Logical discussions aren't penetrating due to spiritual barriers. What do you think the best prayers or spiritual warfare, whoops, or spiritual warfare approaches to utilise? Um, my colleague, um, Mark Jury, does an excellent course on um, spiritual warfare that's offered here through the Arthur Jeffrey Centre. That would be a really helpful one for people just to understand the, the breadth and the, and the depth of spiritual warfare because it's a, a significant issue when you're dealing with Muslim communities. Um, yeah, so I'd encourage you to do that. But do be aware that when you when you're dealing with Muslims, you are going into a spiritual battle. It's, um, and, and do pray for that and ask people to pray for as you're doing that. Don't, don't take that too lightly. Um, why does Allah only love those who do good? It's interesting. There's about 40 verses in the Quran or 30, 40 times where it's talked about Allah's love and 22 of them it talks about people he does not love. So the people who do wrong, the people who commit sin um, and 18 of them talk about the people who he does, he does love and they're the people who do good, who do their prayers, who uh, fulfil all their obligations. So it's very much a works-based performance-based thing. And Allah, I think, um, has this sense of, um, yeah, I'm only going to look after the people who are doing good. A um, bit of lack of imagination, I thought, because nobody really does much good. And uh, you're going to be that way. You're going to have a pretty empty heaven. And that's why Jesus came, so he could fulfill, fill heaven up with uh, people. We, we need saving. You could be in a boat and drive past all these drowning people and not do anything, or you can put out your hand and save them. And that's the, uh, uh, that's the God that we worship. Um, how to respond to Muslims when they bring up Surah 548 to prove the, the Bible is corrupted? He says, Then we revealed the book to you with truth, confirming whatever, uh, whatever of the book was revealed before and protecting and guarding over it. Um, well, they wouldn't use this verse because it actually says that... Um, Allah revealed the book before, um, so that meant the Torah and the Injil, and that he protected and guarded it. In fact, I would use this one to say, Allah, if he's uh, able to do it and if he's true to his word, actually protects his books, all of them. And that's the, the reason for that first story about the, uh, um, the shopkeeper. Um, uh, how to explain Christian fast, fasting versus Ramadan to our Muslim friends. Again, Ramadan is a work. It's a requirement for Muslims. They have to do it. And when I'm talking with Muslims on the street, so during Ramadan, I'd say, what would happen if you didn't fast during Ramadan? And they'd say, that would be bad for me because someday I'm going to stand before God and he would judge me on the basis of that. Christian fasting is not like that. Christian fasting is um, our, our approach to God where we want to draw near to God uh, rather than seeking to do a work that will be accredited to our account. It's quite, quite significantly different. Um, is the book translated into other languages like Indonesian? Um, not yet, but if that's an offer from an Indonesian person, my answer is yes. <laughs> 
Uh, in the light of your previous answer about using Bible stories, do you have some go-to Bible stories when sharing with Muslims or a particular story set? Any guidelines on which stories to choose? Um, I don't. It really depends on the person. When we go to the street and I start sitting there talking with a Muslim person, I don't have a, um, a set kind of approach that I'm going through. I want to respond to that person's needs. When we see Jesus relating to people, he related to, to them according to where they were. Um, and so he took time to find out what there is. And sometimes we might have like 45-minute discussion with a person before anything of spiritual content is brought up with the person. So by that time I found out who the person is, what their family situation is, what they like and they don't like, um, and how, um, you know, how they view life um, and what are some of the struggles they're going through. And on that basis, then I'll say, well, it's interesting because Jesus talked about someone in a similar situation to you. And it, it's, it's a little bit more scary. It'd be easier to have, you know, the four spiritual laws and let's just run through these. Um, but it's a lot more fun um, because you actually get to find out about people and you connect in with their lives and whatever. And we are just amazed. Um, no, I'm just trying to see who I was with the other day. No, I don't think he's here. Um, we, we went out with a, um, a person. Uh, we went out together just chatting to people. Hi, we're talking to Muslims today. Are you a Muslim? Yeah. Uh, do you mind if we chat? No, nah, sit down. 95% of the time, that's the response we get. Very rarely will they say, not interested. Get it from Auss Anglo Aussies a lot. Get out of it. Um, yeah. But with Muslims, they are so open to talk about spiritual things. And you can just talk about it without any embarrassment. You don't have to argue the existence of God, miracles, heaven, hell. It's all, they ticked all of those, no problem. You know, let's go to chapter 15 and start there. It's fantastic. So, uh, get into it. Um, and, whoops, my phone went on a little walk. Okay. All right. Um, okay. I mentor a group of female Afghan uni students in the US. How do I present Jesus to gospel that meets their needs? Many suffering from depression and anxiety from leaving famines, famines behind. Um, maybe families. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. So my wife works with um, with um, Muslim women, and there are specific things in the Bible that are really key for talking to Muslim women. Um, so uh, you've know, got the story of the woman caught in adultery, and just this whole question. Muslim women often live under this sense of shame. Not for anything they've done, but just for being a woman. Um, uh, and kind of fear. Um, and I think it's important to bring out stories like that to them. You can talk uh, uh, a little bit about, say, Martha and Mary. There's actually a whole lot. There's about 80 women named in the Bible. There's lots of stories that you can pick up just to talk about different women um, and how that relates to them. And the, the idea of depression and anxiety is a, is a big one. Um, and just to talk about Jesus as the one who comes to us, you know, he says, come to me all who labour and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. And so he's the one who offers us, opens that door up for us. Um, what are some helpful ways or scriptures to refer to to help Muslims understand the personable nature of God? Uh, I'm not sure... Uh, may, maybe personal nature of God, that, that God is a person. Um, and I think, you know, someone, I, we had a talk, a talk with a Muslim lady the other day. She said, so you believe in, like, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Mother? I said, no. Um, and she couldn't quite work out where the Holy Spirit fit in there. She said, why is it Father and Son? And I said, because relationship is at, at the centre of the nature of God. God is a relational being. And you can start with the story of Adam and Eve, where God would come down and walk with them in the garden. So right from the very beginning, that was open. God never said to people, you know, down to earth there and look after yourselves and see you on judgment day. It was really God's connecting with us all the way through. So I think that's really important to talk about. Um... How can we help female Muslims rega uh, regarding to the cultural dis differences of freedom? There's kind of some disadvantages with being here in the West in that um, uh, Muslims will look around the world and think, OK, or Australia, and they'll say, oh, this is a Christian country, therefore all uh, this is all, uh, this is what Christians do. I had a, a guy who 
become a Christian and um, was living in a Christian, uh, uh, yeah, had been a Christian for a couple of years. And then he came to me one day and he says, oh, what does, what does the Bible say about um, having relations with a person that you're not married to? And I said, oh, it's not really kind of a positive thing. Oh, no one ever told me that before. He assumed because a lot of people were living together, then that was quite okay from a Christian perspective. Um, so he had to have some um, words with his girlfriend that night and she moved out the next day. <laughs> uh, what do you think of using Christophanies and the angel of the Lord appearing to Abraham to prepare the heart of God coming, becoming a man? Uh, yeah, I use this one a lot. Um, so Christophanies mean the appearances of Christ in the Old Testament. And so I talked about um, that one of God used to walk with Adam and Eve in the garden. And someone brought up this one to me the other day. So you say um, no one has ever seen God. Um, Jesus said that. Um, and yet God can be seen. How do you reconcile that diff those differences? And I said, yes, yeah, it's true. First of all, uh, no one can see the complete um, infinite nature of God. God is, in that sense, beyond our human comprehension. We can't see that. But God can make himself uh, a visible and come in a visible form. And that's what Jesus did. But it wasn't just then. I believe that at different times throughout history, the story of um, Abraham, uh, it talks about the, the three that came, the two angels and one, and it identifies him as God. So this would be a, a, a theophany, and I call it a Christophany, an appearance of Christ. Jesus says, and that's why um, he says, uh, Abraham saw my day and he was glad. And they said, get out of it. You're not 50 years old. How could Abraham have seen you? And I believe that was Jesus who came down to give Abraham the news about um, uh, the, the birth of uh, Isaac coming. And also in Isaiah, Isaiah 6, 1, it says, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and a reference in John 2 um, that... Uh, Jesus seeing uh, that um, Isaiah seeing Jesus. Um, yeah, so I think there's a, uh, a thing that can be used in there. Um, in Islam, is Jesus re re returning to judge the world? How do you use this in conversation with Muslims? How is what is their response? Okay, so there's a couple of things in the uh, in the um, uh, in the Hadith. It talks about. Uh, Jesus will come back uh, to earth and he will judge the earth, which is very interesting. But then they say um, he will also um, break the crosses, he will kill the, ki the, the pigs and he will convert all the Christians and Jews to Islam. So it's a bit of a double-edged sword with that one, whichever way you want to go with that. Um, I'm always careful with the Hadith. I'll say that even Muslim scholars... Don't accept all the hadith as authoritative, and some some people would say we don't accept any of the hadith. Um, so um, I'd say, yeah, be careful with that. Um, never put all of your eggs in in that basket, because then they can say, oh, so you believe that Jesus will do all of those things, um, break the crosses, kill the pigs, and convert people to Islam. Say, no, we don't believe that. It doesn't accord with the Bible, so we don't accept that. But we do believe that Jesus will come back. Um, all right. Uh, um, what are the largest errors or contradictions uh, with the differences in the Qur'ats? Okay, um, so the, uh, often people have been told that the, there's only one Qur'an which has always existed in Arabic. If you go anywhere in the world, you can only read one Qur'an. This is not true. I have a little collection of 26 different Arabic Qur'ans in my bookcase at home. As I travelled around the Muslim world, I'd go into a bookshop and say, do you have a copy of the Qur'an in Arabic? And they'd pull one out and I'd say, I've already got this one, do you have another one? And they'd go around and they'd hang there, here's another one, nobody wants to buy this one, um, and I'd get a good price on it. Um, so I'd get, I've got all these collections and they are different, and I'm doing some work on that, doing a comparison. I just did a... Um, a podcast with El Fadi. Diana, do you know if that one's been posted up on the internet? Don't know, yeah. Um, yeah, so we've, we've done a couple on this. The first one went up there. So El Fadi is a Saudi guy who's doing his doctorate through this uh, college. Um, and Saudi who'd become a Christian. And um, we, we had a discussion about this on, the, uh, on his podcast. It's called C... Sorry, what is it? C-I-R-A. Yeah, C-I-R-A, International, Syria International, yeah. Um, so you can go on that website and you can find that discussion where I talk about that. There's a fair bit of stuff on that one. 
All right, last question for tonight. That's what they told me. Do you ever use stories um, about Pharisees in a way that paints them as very similar to Muslims? If so, has this been a helpful strategy? Hmm. Like I tell stories about the Pharisees and say often it was the religious people, the ones who thought that they could earn their own way to God, who were the biggest opponents of Jesus. And he had to face up to that. Um, because Muslims don't know much about the Bible. If you called them a Pharisee, they wouldn't know what that meant. Um, in you know, Christian circles, that would be an insult. Um, yeah, so I, I probably wouldn't use that one because I'm always trying to build bridges to people and uh, seek to draw you know draw them to Jesus so that would be the kind of thing so I'll try and avoid those in my debates you can look at those online um, I can I'll be quite blunt and what out uh, with the uh, person I'm debating with because I know other people will be watching in um, yeah but in in person face-to-face -face conversations I won't I won't do that because I don't think that it will necessarily um, lead to um, good relationships yeah um, yeah, so just to finish up, thank you so much for coming. Are you going to jump up and say something? Oh, I'll just leave it to Dennis to say something. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bernie, for the presentation. Thank you, everyone, for coming tonight and for those who joined us online. And if you're not familiar with what AGC is doing. So apart from organizing events like this from time to time, we also teach a number of different courses. It's like undergraduate, graduate, and postgraduate at Melbourne School of Theology. And if you're watching us online, in the description, there will be a link to our webpage where you can find more about what we are doing or where you can subscribe to our mailing list if you want to be aware of the future events like this. And if you are here with us tonight and you're not sure what we are doing, there are some brochures like this here next to the exit and uh, outside there near the AGC stands. So please hang around and stay with us and let's have some tea and coffee and conversation going. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank you.